Ladies and gentlemen, G. Edward Griffin is an American film producer, author, political lecturer, perhaps best known as the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, uh, a critique of much modern economic theory and practice, especially, obviously, the Federal Reserve System. It's been my pleasure to hang out with him on Jekyll Island and uh, actually get to see where the creature was born. But really, it is, uh, you know, uh, none of that describes the significance of his contribution to the world's understanding of the Federal Reserve System. No one other than Ron Paul has done more to raise awareness about this issue than him with this book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, which I highly recommend. And for all that he has done in the years since releasing it in, in order to promote this message and stay active and keep raising awareness. Mr. Griffin, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for inviting me, Adam. It's a pleasure. Well, let me. What year was uh, the creature from Jekyll Island released? I think that's 1994, I think. 1994. Wow. Yeah. So we're on we're on the the 20th anniversary. Right. Right. Well, let me let me ask. What what do, I mean? We've we've covered these topics before, and I, and I think most of our audience is aware that the Federal Reserve is a racket, that it's creating money out of thin air, that it's devaluing the currency, and it's ripping everybody off. But uh, let's talk a little bit about what's changed in, in, in the last 20 years. What impact do you think this has had, or, or what change is coming as a result of this raised awareness? Well, two good questions. I think the change is obvious, and that is that the, uh, the public is now even aware that there is such a thing as a Federal Reserve. I think. Uh, prior to 1994 and actually prior to 2004 really uh, the phrase federal reserve was something like uh, like a mystery code you know people didn't know anything about it didn't care to know anything about it and what they thought they knew about it was that it must be a government agency of some kind one of you know part of the alphabet soup but who cares <laughs> Excuse me, sir. I, ha I have to interrupt for just a second. As yes. awesome as your beard is, I believe it is speaking into your microphone more than you are at the moment. You mean it's scratching, making it sound? <laughs> there you go. Excellent. All okay. right. Please continue. We'll de de awesome, de awesome it then. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the f I think the the change is that people are aware now that there even is such a thing as a Federal Reserve, and uh, not only that, they're kind of mad at it. They're not. They're not sure exactly how it's working, but I think, as you pointed out quite correctly, that uh, the general public knows that they're getting ripped off somehow by the uh, the banks, and they know that the Federal Reserve somehow is involved with the banks. Uh, so that's not a really a deep understanding, but at least it, it's halfway there, you know, and prior to that time, uh, people were giving it no concern at all, no thought at all. So I think we made great progress because I think one of the objectives of the Fed from the very beginning is to hide behind this mask of, of uh, appearing to be just another government agency, which of course it is not. Uh, it's a cartel. We can talk about that perhaps later. But uh, So that's the first thing. But your next question is uh, perhaps more uh, interesting, which is where where is it going? Mm -hmm. What do we expect to happen with this trend? Well. Uh, it can go one of two directions, um, and the one is a good direction and the other is not so good, of course. They usually have that kind of a, of a uh, choice. The, uh, the good correction, of course, is that people will continue to explore and learn and find out that the Fed is not a government agency, that it's a, uh, a banking cartel, and that it's been given um, through legislation called the Federal Reserve Act. This cartel has been given a monopoly over the nation's money. If you can imagine that. Here, here's a, a, a private uh, consortium of uh, private companies, banks, who have been given this, the power of government to create money for the nation. And that's really what they pulled off. And uh, they created out of uh, nothing. There are no uh, re requirements or limitations except those which it sets itself. Well, hold on. May, may, may I just uh, interrupt to clarify, if, if, if I may, that there is a, you say that they are creating money for the nation, it's more that they are having the money that they have created forced on the nation by government, correct? Well, that's part of it. They create the nation's money. And then the government says, okay, everybody, pretend that this money that the banks created is government money. Just pretend like it. And we're going to require by, uh, by law that you use it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those are the two aspects. Now, if they just created money out of nothing, as they used to do pretty much uh, with something called banknotes, uh, well, then it, it would still be pretty bad, but at least people could escape. They could say, well, we don't want those banknotes. They're just backed by the reputation of the bank. 
And we know for sure, we know the bankers, and they're, they're not very reputable, so we're not going to use the money. Uh, but when, the, when it appears to be the nation's money, when it says United States of America across the top of it, and when it's actually printed by the Treasury, and all of the people think it's government money, and the, there are uh, you know, laws on the books uh, uh, requiring us to use it. We have to use it or we go to prison. So it, it's sort of a, it's, it's, it's one of the reasons people think that the Federal Reserve is a government agency is because there are laws in place to require us to use their money. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, so it, it appears that uh, it's government money. Now, hold on. Of course, uh, it, I, the law behind it. I want to ask you to clarify that as well, because a lot of people don't understand what that means. And most Americans never bother to ask even well, where does money come from? So what do you say to someone who says, well, that's that's not true. Don't don't we have the choice? Couldn't we use whatever we wanted? Uh, well, it's partially true. You can you can use barter, of course. You can use anything you wish for barter. Uh, you can even use uh, gold coins and silver coins in uh, in exchange for goods and services. And you could say, well, that's as good as money. But when it comes to the legal definition of money, uh, meaning that it's the nation's money, it's the American currency, and there's a law forcing you to accept it, then that's a whole different animal. So and the people, yes, they're free to some extent to use other things as a medium of exchange, but they must accept American Federal Reserve notes. They must accept that. Nobody can, uh, can decline to accept that in the payment of debt, public or private. And, and you could make the case that maybe as an individual working off the grid, if you're, if you're self-employed, you can kind of escape that. But obviously, with all the major corporations so tied to government and corporatism, you know that all of those resources are stuck into the dollar system, and there's no way that the, the economy as a whole can divorce itself from, from that situation. Yeah, it's, it'd be very difficult. Of course, that's the uh, the goal, the magic, uh, uh, the bullet. There, all these alternative currencies that uh, are springing up. They're all find, hoping to find a way that they can somehow break through that barrier and have these alternative currencies be used in common uh, commercial exchange. But as long as uh, all of the uh, money has to go through the banking system, of course, they're kind of sitting on that, and it makes it almost impossible to uh, to do. So how, how are you going to pay your utility bill? You know, if the, if the utility companies don't accept anything except Federal Reserve notes mm -hmm. or, or checks written against Federal Reserve notes, well, then you have to use them to pay your, uh, your gas bill and your light bill. And uh, grocery stores and so forth, they all require us to use uh, uh, currency, official currency. So uh, that's uh, the big problem uh, as the alternative currencies are trying to get restaurants to use it and gas stations to use it. They make a little bit of headway, but it's still 99% uh, of the road has to be traveled yet. So where are we going with this? Where are we going with it? Well, as I said, there are two, two ways, uh, two directions that we can go. If the, if the people continue to uh, learn as to what the true nature of the system is, they're going to demand a change. They're going to demand um, a return to honest banking. They're going to demand the elimination of the Federal Reserve. Get rid of that cartel. I mean, it's no different than a banana cartel or a, a sugar cartel or an oil cartel. I mean, what sense would it make to give, <laughs> uh, you know, grocery stores a cartel, a, a monopoly over all food so there'd be no competition and so forth? Hold, so hold the people on, would demand on. getting rid of the Federal Reserve. <laughs> I, want, I want to explore this. this is, that's a really exciting way of looking at this because I've never considered it. But you're right. Okay, so we, we, we don't, we, we kind of take it for granted because it's been in place our whole lives. This is the yeah. money system. This is just, we don't know where money comes from. This is just the way it is. And yet you can just draw this parallel really quick. Like, well, what if the government said only Safeway can, you know, w w it, it will issue official government food. And that's the only food any anybody in this country is allowed to eat has to be this kind of food. And you know that there would be ridiculous, disastrous consequences from that. That like choice is removed, corruption is rampant, you know, uh, the, the, the kind of GMOs and processed foods will become even more dominant in our food supply and you won't have the choice to opt out. But we don't, what we don't realize is that having a monopoly on the money is probably more destructive than having a government monopoly on food. That's right, because the, the money invades all the other areas of commerce. They all depend on money as the medium of exchange. So it's really, whoever has a monopoly over the money has a pretty good stranglehold over everything, yes. everything, yes. you know? 
including politics, by the way, because politics is run with money. And if you're, if you're the kingfish and you're the guy that can create the money and make it available and restrict it to some groups, you are eventually in a position to be able to buy up governments. You can buy it up one politician at another, after another. And finally, you own the government. So you wind up with the situation we have now where people are saying, well, why doesn't the government control the banks? What they don't realize is that long ago, the banks took control of the government. Uh -huh. and, you see, that's why it doesn't work. So where are we going with this? Back to that. People have to recognize this reality and demand real change. That means we've got to get rid of all of these, these political hacks that are in Washington now that are beholden to the present system. They all have to go because they're, you know, they're already proven their unworthiness. We need to get people in, into office who have no axe to grind that want to return to free banking, honest banking. Banking needs to be there, of course. Banking can and should perform a very vital service, but they shouldn't be given special privileges. They shouldn't be given monopoly privileges. They shouldn't be bailed out when they fail. You know, what other company can can say, well, you know, we will, we lost our shirt last year, but uh, we're so important that now we've got to go to the taxpayers, and the taxpayers had better give us some money so we can do it again, you know? So we have to stop bailing out the crooked banks and, and the fraudulent banks. Return to uh, sound money, and everything would be fine. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be easy, it would be a lot of rough road ahead, but it, we could return to a very prosperous economy uh, again. And that's one way to go. I'm hoping that's what will happen. The other way is that people will continue to mumble and grumble and say, yeah, those bankers are no darn good. Uh, what we need is more government regulation so that we can force them to be good, not realizing that the government and the banks are basically in the same bed anyway. You can argue as to you know, who's got the right side and who's got the left side of the bed, but they're both in, in bed. So as long as people keep turning to government and more regulations and rules uh, to correct the problem, they're just going to get more and more of the problem, which means that the system will collapse. I mean, I hate to say it, but you ask me, and my opinion is that there's no way that this can continue. It gets worse and worse and worse. And the economy is being plundered. The American people are being plundered, legally plundered by this system. There's only one place for that to end, and that's in total collapse. So that's the other place we can go. And, and I'm afraid right now we're still going down that path rather than to the enlightenment path. But we're doing our best to change that. And I know you are too, Adam. Oh, I appreciate that. And now in the past, you, you've advocated for a government-issued uh, metals-backed currency. This sounds like, uh, are, are you moving away from that position? No. Oh, no, no, I'm not at all. I think that, uh, I think that uh, all currencies, the best currencies, should be backed by uh, precious metals. But there are alternatives, and I think people well, should hold, be hold free. On, uh, uh, well, I, well, I want to then hone in on this, but, but you're saying that the, the government should still be issuing the currency, but in a, in a fair way. Well, okay, that's, uh, that's a, a deeper question than it may sound, because personally, I would rather see currency issued not by the government. I think governments are the least trustworthy bodies to mm. issue currency or anything for that matter. The only thing governments are good for uh, are fighting wars, really, and, uh, you know, protecting, <laughs> uh, supposedly protecting uh, their people. Um, but uh, I recognize that most people uh, think that, you know, governments should have that sovereign right to issue their own money. And I say, okay, that's fine, as long as it's real money and it's backed by something of tangible value and that people don't get ripped off by this uh, Ponzi scheme of, you know, creating fiat money that's backed by nothing except right. debt. Right. Well, if it's, you know. if it's, so you're saying it wouldn't be forced on anyone in that scenario, which I think we, we agree on, right? That's, that's really important. You wouldn't have the government forcing the currency on anyone. But if the government, if a government was issuing a metals-backed currency, how would that even survive with free market competition? I mean, have you ever had a free market and then had government doing something that, that was able to surpass it without somehow forcibly stifling the free market? Well, there have been, believe it or not, brief periods of history where there was uh, uh, honest banking and government money was literally backed by bullion. Mm -hmm. uh, Great, Great Britain in its most prosperous, uh, powerful era uh, had exactly that kind of a system. The United States was almost on that basis for uh, a period of about 60 or 80 years. Uh, when I say almost, because the, the money was uh, not backed 100% by, uh, 
by gold or silver, but it was pretty high, probably in the range of 80% for a long, long period of time. Uh, and during those brief periods of history where uh, government money was uh, restricted to uh, being backed by something of value like that, uh, the economy's prospered. And in, it's, uh, it's probably the biggest lesson to be learned if you can study those periods of history and see that these are the greatest periods of economic advance. Uh, and but your your question about freedom to choose is the critical thing. Yes. Um, you know if if the government issues money, and people are free to use it or not to use it as they wish, what will happen is that you know these legal tender laws are what we require you to use their money. If legal tender laws were stricken from the books, and people were free to use government money or not to use it, or to use somebody else's money, uh, they could use um, Disneyland books if they wish to, you know, in exchange, if they wanted to. Give them freedom to choose. What would happen is that if the government money was good money and backed by gold or silver, everybody would choose to use it. But if the government money was monopoly money, funny money like they have now, and there was an alternative to choose, even if it was issued by the guy next door, if he printed gold coins in his basement, and everybody knew that those gold coins really were 99.99% gold, everybody would use his money instead, you see. Mm -hmm. So the freedom to choose, uh, Ron Paul calls it uh, freedom in, in currency, alternative currencies. If people could choose whatever currency they want, if they want to use yens or, or Deutschmarks or, or dollars, whatever, then the free market would step in and uh, the, the benefits, the profits, the success would go to those that provided the greatest service. Now, there's a distinct advantage that fiat currency has, aside from being forced on people, which is a nice advantage when your business is backed by the full guns and power of the United States federal government, but it, it, has, it does have one kind of core economic advantage over a commodity-backed currency in the sense that a commodity-backed currency costs money or gold, rather, being taken out of the circulation in the economy, if, if, if gold is being used for money, it can't be used for industrial purposes or for jewelry or for so on. And it, is, it takes that value, in a sense, out of immediate usage in the economy, whereas a, a currency that's backed by nothing, as we know, it's a debt-based system in the United States when the government, uh, you know, it, it makes the, the, the way the debt is paid back to the Federal Reserve is by, is by taxing the American people. But now we have the emerging cryptocurrencies, which seem to have the advantage of both in the sense that they are not backed by a commodity. They're simply a universal IOU system or you know, global accounting ledger that's not backed by anything, but has value in its nature as a ledger, and it is completely voluntary. Do you think that Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies have the potential to, to even outcompete uh, w what you would term as, as, as honest uh, metals-backed currencies? Well, it remains to be seen, doesn't it? Uh, I, I, I like uh, these, uh, these uh, cyber currencies or cryptocurrencies a lot because, uh, on the surface at least, they appear to be limited. That's, that's part of their mystique, is that everyone agrees at the beginning that there would only be so many and then that's it. So after that number is reached, then it'll be playing the same game as you brought up regarding gold. Then you, you can't expand the money supply anymore. Right. It's limited just like it would be limited to gold. But the trouble with that is, uh, well, there are several things I think wrong with it. One is that it makes me nervous when, when uh, this medium of exchange really is, is nothing um, but vaporware. You know, it doesn't really exist except in digits in a computer. And uh, uh, one of the historically... Um, proven advantages of good money is the fact that it has um, value, intrinsic value, they sometimes call mm -hmm. it, for something else. So well, that well, even if you if well, you I'll, can't I'll, use it for money, you can use it for something else. Right. And so these don't have that. Well, hold and, on you know, a second. If, I, I, if something I, would happen to the internet, let's say, right. let's say we have a, a solar flare that takes out all the satellites and all the power generators, and we don't have internet for uh, 10 years or something mm -hmm. like that. What happens to all this money? Well, it's it's gone. That's all. Well, well, uh, hold on. Realistically, if in, the, in if ten years in the future people were demanding a gold-backed currency, it would be largely represented digitally in bank ledgers and in bank accounts and things like that. People would. Uh, we're not. We're not proposing as people who 
are fans of this being a possibility that everybody's going to you know, carry around a little pouch of gold coins. I mean, that's silly. And a lot of people misunderstand that. But no, a gold-backed currency is something that we could manage digitally and would have all those same problems. But I'd like to just dispute one point in that you said it has no value whatsoever. And here is where you know, we have to recognize the legitimate value of the US dollar, right? It has value as an accounting system. You can count in it. It is a unit. It is a piece of paper with a number on it. And it's important to note that that's all it is. But all of the value in cryptocurrency comes from its inherent security in its encryption and its value and function then as a ledger. Well, yeah, that's why I said when I used the word value, I added the word intrinsic value which means that it has, it has a use, it has a value for something other than money. Okay, okay, well, cause, and, all right, yeah. fair enough. Yeah, and, and that's, that's the distinction, and it's a good, a good thing you brought that up. And, and also, I noticed that there was uh, an article I read recently by one of the uh, advocates, I don't know that he was a founder, but one of the advocates of the, uh, of the Bitcoin concept, and he said, well, you know, once we reach the point where we can't make any more, we'll just start another Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, there go right all of a sudden I saw how this limitation of uh, the numbers available are going to probably be circumvented. If people want more of it, they'll just start another one <laughs> and uh, then we'll have two and then we'll have four and then eight and so forth. Well, already and, we have hundreds yeah, actually. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, anyway, the uh, the point is that um, I'm all for I'm all for anything like Bitcoin that takes the uh, uh, the power away from governments mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. enforce whatever decrees they decide are politically um, advantageous to the politicians, right. especially in money. So anything that does that, I'm all for it. But I do just think that we ought to be cautious about the fact that these currencies do not have intrinsic value. Right. And, and that certainly is something that needs to be taken into account when choosing mm -hmm. a currency. But it's just so exciting that already we have this power with the Internet to choose to stop using the government money. And that is such an incredible uh, you know, opportunity that people have now to at least get out of the dollar system, even with all of the weaknesses uh, and, and potential pitfalls for cryptocurrencies. It sounds a lot better than holding a dollar that is constantly losing value in order to pay off government sponsors. And, and well, you, you <laughs> bet. Yeah. And that's why, of course, we know, uh, we just know that governments around the world are are not going to let these cryptocurrencies uh, go unnoticed. They're already maneuvering now to figure out ways. Excuse my phone ringing there, but anyway, <laughs> they're, they're maneuvering now to figure out ways to close down the access of these currencies to the internet, uh, make them illegal, to charge people with crimes of uh, money laundering and all that sort of thing. Right. And this is what governments always do. Right, trying to crack down on any competition or anybody that exactly. threatens their racket. Exactly. And, and I think the most important thing to say, we might differ a little bit in our predictions, but as people who believe in the free market, we understand that the, the most important thing we can say about the future is that we don't know because we don't presume to have the wisdom of millions of people exercising their preferences in every single decision. But we can inspire yeah. people in the present by raising this awareness to want to make those decisions more conscientiously and to stop feeding into the government by using the dollar or you know, opting out of it as much as possible. Mr. Griffin, yeah. thank you so much for yeah. joining us today. Well said. Thank you, Adam. This was one of the things that, um, you know, that white America didn't want blacks to have. There's just no way <laughs> that, that a family can run on a free market model. AR lower receivers, so the evil, you know, Adam Lanza guy.